Roy. Lane Lechman. Good morning, Lane. Good morning. And Ken, you are you have the helm, my friend. So if you see up there that somebody needs to be admitted, if you would just it says admit. Can you do that? I guess so. How will I know? I'll let you know. I'll keep my eye on it too. <laughs> All right, everybody. So here's what I've decided. I've decided that we're not going to try to finish this book. <laughs> Because I can't get through more than a chapter. I mean, I've got two pages of notes here, and I don't think we're going to get through this chapter. Plus, today's chapter is um, my wheelhouse. Uh, you probably have heard a lot of what I'm going to say before, um, but it's always nice to have somebody else permit uh, or to be reminded of where I learned it in the first place, because Dave was my professor. Um, but Today we're going to talk, when we talk about Christian hope, I mean, a lot of the, as we began, we talked about how, uh, as a theological doctrine, Christian hope is often referred to as eschatology, which, you know, if you have fun with Latin, is the words about the end, um, the eschaton. Um, and that's actually, actually it's appropriate to take today a little bit. Because, sorry, I need this coffee. Um, because we're going to talk about heaven and hell. Um, I actually love talking about it. Uh, but before we do, let us pray. God, you alone are our hope. You are our hope in the darkness of Advent as it begins, you are the hope that meets us in unlikely places. You are the hope that dwells with us, all of us, through the spirit of Christ, our living Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so how many of you have had this question posed to you by someone at some time or other? If you die tonight, <laughs> you know where you go. <laughs> How many? Raise your hands. Okay. So that's the popular expression of heaven and hell. The other place that I learned more about heaven and hell than anywhere else was in like Looney Tunes cartoons. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. There's always, heaven is always uh, clouds with, sorry, there's a little extra there, uh, clouds with angels strumming harps and hell with uh, flames and uh, devils with pointy ears and pitchforks, right? Uh, torturing people on spits over fire. Um, what? Don't say. And a good poet. I don't see theologian. But, by the way, this is not in the book, but this is just my fun little tidbit that I like to put out. Other than a few characters that you know from the Bible, like Judas, do you know who mostly populates the inferno that Dante wrote about? His political enemies of Dick. <laughs> Still things never change. Uh, yeah. But okay, so the the if you died tonight, where might where would you go? The other way this is sometimes posed to us, how many of you have ever received uh, some kind of a tract? Somebody is handed you and at the end of it and it tells you all about the popular one, and I talked about this several months ago. Uh, Campus Crusade has the four spiritual laws. And, and it lays out you know, this particular theological worldview. And then at the end, so that you don't go to hell, there is a prayer for you to pray. And if you say the prayer, then you don't go to hell. Right? Um, 
Here's the thing about that, though, from a reformed perspective. Um, that places entirely too much agency on you, right? That going to heaven or avoiding hell is your responsibility. And, and one in which you can take control of by saying this particular prayer. And as such, it's also got this thing of, uh, it, it's, it becomes this exclusive destination, right? So in one framework, and this is the, the kind of sinner's uh, prayer framework. <laughs> Sorry, this bothers me. Um, who goes to heaven according to the sinner's prayer of prayer? Got out the answer if you know it. We go to heaven. What do you have to do to go to heaven? Say the prayer. And what is the prayer genu generally uh, ask you to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Right? So, Heaven, according to this framework, is for those who believe. And what happens if you don't believe? You go to hell. Hell is for those who don't believe. So, uh, and specifically, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the Dalai Lama is going to hell, and Gandhi is going to hell. And any number of other people that you can name with who aren't explicitly Christian are going to hell, according to this. Right? So you have to say two things those who believe on those who don't go. Oh. <laughs> Clara? <laughs> okay, now step back. And just kind of think about the world that we live in, popular imagination. According to the popular imagination, who goes to heaven? Good people. Good people go to heaven. And hell is for bad people. And who judges? Don't steal my thunder, Kathy. <laughs> but, and especially in this framework, um, and, and this framework, quite honestly, heaven has this very long standing, has been used as a very long standing enticement for evangelization. Right? Um, the reason to believe is so that you don't burn for all of eternity. Right? Or conversely, the reason to be good is so that you don't burn for all eternity. So let's talk a little bit, of, but, but here's the problem, and, 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 and this will get named. Actually, it's funny because I remember um, I did a play in, well, I was cast in a play in Denver that I ended up um, And I remember talking to the director, and I had told him that I had gone to a Jesuit high school, and he said, Oh, the Jesuits, I remember I went up to Father So and so and said, uh, I don't believe that a loving God would send people to hell. And he's like, Well, that's both nonsensical and horrific. And but the objection still stands, right? The problem of blue, blue. Uh, we need to let. Uh, we need to let. We need to let. Christy, can you just click the blue admin button at the very top? If you look at the screen, oh, and just click on admit. You got it, Dan. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Well done. All right. Um. So the, the problem with this is that we you're evangelizing and you're saying, oh God loves you. Really? That 
loves you. God loves you, but if you don't believe in if, if you don't believe, uh, God will burn you for all of eternity. To which people rightly kind of object and say, that sounds pretty abusive. That's kind of like the people who's like, believe me, if this hurts me more than it hurts you. As they're you know, beating that. Right? So um, so people have rightly raised some objection about this. Um, and here's the thing. The problem with either of these paradigms is that heaven becomes the reward and hell becomes the punishment. If you're a good reformed theologian like me, and you've heard me talk about the film Unforgiven in this class, um, God's grace does not operate on the reward punishment scale. Right? There is not a thing. This is why when and it's it's very hard because pastorally speaking, um, I have to bite my tongue. And I fight it very hard when somebody invariably says about someone who is deceased that they were a good person, so they're going to have. Because I want to say. No, that has nothing to do with it. I, I, you, I, you, you, you can't be good enough. You can't be good enough to earn God's reward. And you are not so bad as to deserve God's punishment. Um, because that's not the paradigm that grace works on. Grace works on the paradigm that it's a gift. If you have to earn, if you have to earn a gift, is it a gift? It's a wage, right, right. And conversely, if you're your, uh, <clears throat> we talked about this justice wise, right? When we talk about justice popularly, um, it comes in the form of the justice system, which is largely interested in punishing, but. In God's kingdom, justice is restored. The purpose of justice is to restore. So God is neither interested in rewarding the faithful nor punishing the unfaithful. God is interested in loving all people with a love that is a gift. Right? Um, that's the problem that Reformed Christianity has with both the tractate that says, you have to say the prayer to avoid hell, or you have to be a good person to avoid hell. Reform Christianity says, you don't have to do, excuse my language, excuse my language, internet world. And this is not, this is said, not unironically. Um, you don't have to do a damn thing to deserve God's love. Because God's love is freely given. It's not, it doesn't operate. It deserves got nothing to do. Right? It doesn't operate on that, that level. So, if it's not reward and punishment, um, it's not something we do for ourselves. Um, it is not, heaven is not the entitlement of the worthy, right? You're not worthy. It's not about that. And I'm not saying, you're, and here's where Reform Christianity has kind of gone down the rabbit hole, is they said you're not worthy, and they're like, so we're miserable worms. Yeah, that's not it either. You are um, made in the image and likeness of a God who loves you without measure. And so you may respond to that or you may not respond to that. We're going to get into it when we start talking about and what we're really talking about. Uh, because here's the thing. According to the sinner's prayer, even like, you, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have faith in God, right? You have to do it. You have to have faith. Well, our tradition doesn't speak that. West Minster, which is the uh, confession, says that faith is something that persons have not of themselves. 
It is a gift of God. So it's not simply a matter of pulling ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps, right? It's not about digging deep and finding that faith. Because faith ultimately is a gift, which is really hard for particularly North American Christians to get behind. Because we are a can-do, pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of people, right? And so a whole faith system that says, yeah, it's not really about that. It's a gift that's given to you. Which is hard. Because we want to be able to do it for ourselves. But um, I will say, this is a book, but I'm going to put this word up because... It's just like become my favorite word. Because you can read it in a couple of different ways. And it's not always considered positive. Right? Is there more? Yeah. Thank you. Look right. Surrender. Right? I mean, seen in, in, in we don't like this word when it's the French, right? Oh, wait, surrender. Um, you know, Joe. <laughs> anyway, but but when you surrender to the idea that it's not up to you, that you are entirely in the hands of God, and that those hands can be trusted, it's going to change the way you operate in the world. Right? It isn't. And this is the other thing, it isn't just about me. And we'll get into this a little bit because trusting that. <laughs> Thank you for your message. Oh, I made it safely. I'm glad. As you can see. Do you need something? That door's locked. Okay. Uh, but it's whatever, whatever. Okay. Thank you. I'll. I'll... I see Rachel bothering you. No, oh, you're good. You're good. Thank you. Okay. Um, right. It's about well, and it's about how you operate in the world, right? Think about this. Like, okay, if if the sinners, if the tract is right, and all I have to do is say the prayer, and then I'm done, right? So glad I can check that off my list. Now I'm going to get on with the rest of my life. However, if you are living here then the way you start looking at the rest of your life begins to change because, well, if the most important relationship in my life with God does not require me to do X, Y, and Z, if, so that basically says, this is not a transactional relationship. Then all of the other transactional relationships in my life get called into question. That's not here. That's just okay. Yes. Yes. Sure. I did in the and uh, then when I went to college and when they came to me with that track, they showed me the track. I said, "Oh my gosh, all I have to do is believe." I don't have to do all that stuff. <laughs> and Mark Luther said, yes. But in my young mind, what it really was, is I'm surrendering into the right. More than just the, the word, because the old government, he said, I'm done with all that stuff. Right. It, but, uh, so there was a lot of surrender within that Prayer with that young lady that wanted to save soul. And uh, then as I did my life, like or not, you just learn a lot. So it's not, I understand what you're saying, and I read it in the book too about the actions, but I'm also saying it's not such a bad thing when you're young. Ah. It's, uh, yeah. it's easily influenced um, backward type person. You know, right. So it's not a horrible thing. Right, exactly. And I don't know if you all remember I, when I the, the sermon I preached a couple months ago about my kind of encounter with that. 
um, I had a really powerful experience, and I don't want to discount it. I'm just glad I don't. I didn't stay there. Right. Um, I actually think that I don't want to say this because it's, it sounds a little dismissive. It's a little. It's like the reverse of. It's funny that you had that experience, Diana. Because can I tell what you told me? Can I tell what you told me last week? Terry has a family member who brother. Oh, oh uncle. Yeah. He became Catholic. He became Catholic because he wanted the structure. He wanted to know what to do. Give me the list. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to believe. So it goes both ways, right? This is reformed. I, I want to own that. Like this is my bias. I am a reformed Christian. Uh, this this is this is not what all Christianity teaches. I I'm obviously calling into question some of of that kind of language, but it's very much at the heart of the Reformation, right? I mean, the heart of the Reformation is um, the church abusing that relationship through um, indulgences. You know, pay us so much, and we'll say the mass so that we can get your loved ones out of purgatory and into heaven, right? Beautiful cathedrals all over Europe built on that system, right? Um, yeah, crazy. So, um, but here's the thing about, too, about the whole, um, you have to be good to go to heaven. What does Jesus say? Well, what does Jesus say? No one tells me to die. Don't tell your sins to a man in the box. That's how you get to heaven? Well, what is... So what is Jesus, Jesus says, I came not for the righteous, but for sinners. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. I think you said you might have life more Yes. Now we're gonna get there. Hold that thought. I'm looking at the clock, so I'm like, man, you're taking too much time. But yes, um, we're gonna get there. So so but I'm, what I'm trying to do at the outset here is to deconstruct this idea that of, of what either popularly um, in the culture or even popularly within some corners of the church has been held as what heaven and hell are for. Okay. Um, and 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 we're gonna get there soon. But I want you to consider this question. Is hell, is heaven, are, are heaven and hell destinations? Oh, so the absence of God in your life. <laughs> yeah. Feel my thunder. You and Kathy, there's a corner. <laughs> on that, by the way. I mean, for a while there, there was very, it was very popular in certain circles uh, around Halloween to create hell houses. And so young people would be ushered through a series of rooms in which horrible things, you know, but these are all the people in hell. They're all the people who did horrible things like got an abortion or drove drunk or and it was, it was you know, and then at the end with the, the cell. It was, you know, say the, say the prayer so that you don't end up in this horrible place that you, that you just witnessed, right? So the very powerful, and the reason I like to talk about it is because it has a very powerful hold on the popular imagination, both Christian and non-Christian, right? I mean, last year when Grace was in school, uh, no, two years ago, she had uh, some roommates, and this roommate said, oh, these Christians, they just do all these 
charitable things so that they can get into heaven. Thank God my daughter had to go to church every Sunday for her young life because she said, even though she doesn't go to church anymore, she said, my dad doesn't. It's like, my work is done. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So that has no allure for me. Right. right. Like I don't I don't see that. But to your point, I was thinking to myself, a couple of the young girls were reading it, right? And were it seemed like it was striking a tone with them. Like if if only you do this, then you're gonna get this lovely, you right. know, sail into the sunset and be ending. Right. Um, and and you understand nobody gets coming over to find them otherwise. Right, that makes sense. That I'm a little worried about. Right, no one else is explaining to them that that's not the only option. There's somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, yeah. But it's, 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 it's my pastor. Let me get him on the phone. Like that. I mean, I'm above it. <laughs> but, but this is to your point. Yes. And the reason why we're having this class is because there isn't a whole lot of Christian narrative out there. And what I'm going to tell you is going to make a lot of sense. And yet it's not as, it just, it doesn't have that Hollywood appeal, right? It's just, that's a really powerful narrative. And listen, um, those beautiful cathedrals, by the way, all over Europe built with indulgences, have you looked at the frescoes? Oh. Have you seen the final judgment in the Sistine Chapel? I mean, it's, it's by the way, also uh, a page out of Dante. There are figures in that final judgment that were actually well known at the time. Uh, so uh, I just find that hilarious because it's such a strong impulse, right? I mean, it's a curse. You know, you go straight to hell. Right? We want we want to punish. We want to judge. That's we want to judge. judge. Want to judge. Want to uh, by the way, <laughs> thank you. Uh, this is not on my outline. By the way, what is the tree from which we are forbidden to eat? Yeah. Right. Why do you think? Because it opens us to judgment. It's interesting. It's an interesting story when you start to think about it. I love it. All right. Yes. There's a part of life where it's just hard to accept some actions that are so evil and you know, blowing up buildings, murdering people, you know, where it's intentional and deliberate. And there's been no provocation. And when that happens, there, there's such a, a basic instinct to think that this has to stop and that, you know, that you hope that they'll be punished at some point. And so, I mean, it's a sense of judgment. And I think there's a part of our rational life that we still think that there needs to be some way that good succeed and, and that evil can be suppressed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I and I, I hope we get there. I, I think I'm I think I'm gonna get us there. Um but what immediately came to my mind as you were saying that Diane uh, and I'm mindful that Lane is on the um Zoom but I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I don't play one on TV. But I do know about the amygdala because I I am the parents of Trauma reactive kid. And what I know is, is that um, the, the primitive part of our brain, when threatened, fight, or flight, or freeze, but fight is pretty high up on the list, right? And I think that the impulse that you name, part of it is at least, and I'm just going to speak of my own personal experience. When I am hurt, which is traumatic, I want to fight. I want to hurt back, right? Sure, Just, yeah, and, 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 right, right. But there's a difference. 
between making it stop and and retribution. Right. Because I think justice, God's justice is very much about the stop. The retribution is the part that I think we add. And it's understandable. Right? I mean, I know it's kind of become a cliche, you know, a pop culture cliche, but it's true. Or people do hurt people. Right? Um, so there's there's some truth in that cliche. It's kind of it's fun. One of the things that David does is he, he keeps coming back to Jesus. <laughs> and one of the things he observes is um, some of the people, like just to further disabuse us of this notion that the righteous are rewarded with heaven. Jesus's words of condemnation are often for the most righteous and religious people of his time. Right? Which is really, I mean, that's a thing that we as believers need to really kind of take to heart. Um, because Jesus does not have kind words for people who are uh, so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Um, right? Okay, so let's just dive into a brief history of hell um, and kind of survey the different sources that contribute to this picture that has emerged. So, um, if you were to pick up Hebrew scripture, you wouldn't see much about hell. You would see Dale. Dale is under the earth. Sheol is uh, where the dead go. Right? So that, and here's the thing about Sheol. It is not a uh, absence of God, right? Uh, if I hit Psalm 139, one of the Psalms in the Bible, where can I go from your spirit and where can I flee from your presence? If I extend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there, right? Um, even the darkness is not dark, dark to you. So uh, in Hebrew thought, Shale is not a place of punishment. Shale is simply where you go when you die. You go to the place of the dead. You descend. And, and we're going to get to the descent thing in just a second, but it's a little later in the outline. Um, but it's not punishment. It is the inescapable reality of death. Right? We all go down to the dust. Right? <clears throat> all right. So then you get this word in the New Testament. Uh, well, you get a word that Jesus uses. And it's never, it's never, you never get this word in your English translation. It's always translated as hell. But the word is Gehenna. Now here's the thing. Gehenna is a it's an actual place. It's a valley south of Jerusalem that is associated with fire rites of pagan religions, right? Um, some have said it is where children were sacrificed, right? So Gehenna is a place that represents Israel's unfaithfulness because pagan religions are often what are attributed to Israel's downfall, right? You, you didn't get rid of the high places, right? High places were places of pagan worship. You, you brought foreign gods into the temple, right? So there is a sense in which Gehenna is represented a, a, a kind of unfaithfulness. I've also heard it suggested that it was a literal burning garbage, right? So when you start to get fiery images of hell, of Gehenna, well, yeah, it was a literal place where garbage was burned. And it's also, and probably garbage was burned there because of its association with pagan rites, right? We're not going to, there's, it's not fit for anything other than garbage, right? Okay. Um, 
But for Jesus, if you listen to it, Jesus, when he talks about hell, this is not a place. It is the byproduct, like, so if you, if you look at Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, and the whole section of, you heard it was said, but I say to you, right? You know the section? And Jesus teaches about anger. He teaches about lust. He teaches about, uh, make sure I'm getting them all. Um, so adult, anger, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation, um, particularly like the, uh, there's the one uh, better for you, if your eye causes you to sin, cut out, cut it out, it's better for you to lose one eye than for, for the, the entirety of you to be thrown into hell. Okay, so you can get really hung up on the literalism there, which I've always I'm always fond of bringing up to people who are like, I believe the literal word of God. And like, you have two eyes. How do you have two eyes? <laughs> you believe in the literal word of God. Oh, well, Jesus didn't know us speaking figuratively. Oh, so you believe in figurative language. Great. The Bible's full. Um, but here, what is, are, in that section, whether it's lust or anger or, you know, what is the, the, the byproduct that Jesus is speaking to is alienation, right? That somehow we are breaking relationship through our actions in these variety of ways. And the result of breaking relationship is, for Jesus, that's the definition of hell, right? Um, so when people say, do you believe in hell? I'm like, have you seen the paper? <laughs> yeah. Where is, well, it's, well, it's, right now it's in Ukraine and it's in the Middle East and it's in the house down the street and it's over, you know, in the rehab. Uh, it's in a lot of places where relationships are broken. If by a variety of by a variety of sin, there I see. Right? Okay, so alienation. <clears throat> Notice this though. He starts with interpersonal, right? This section here is about um, what we do to each other with our anger, with our lust, with our curses, with you know, with our oaths. Um, Suggestion seems to be, though, I mean, when we talk about hell, that seems to be like a divine thing. But what Jesus is kind of drawing a line to is by saying that when we alienate others, we necessarily alienate ourselves from Right? Kind of like in First John when he writes, a person cannot say they love God and deny the person in need. Right? You can't live here and say, oh, I need God, we're tight. Because God's like, really? Because the way you treat your brother and your sister isn't right. Okay. By now, this is like the fifth week we've been doing this year. Like, you've got to be waiting for the shoe to drop, right? <laughs> when is Matthew going to take a shot at Greek philosophy? Hades. <laughs> Which is also often a word that Jesus uses, which is the Greek word and Greek term, right? And Hades has its whole 
mythology. It's the Greek, but it's essentially it's the Greek version of Sheol. You know, ultimately, it's just a place where you go when you die. It's where all the day, right? Um, but in Revelation, <laughs> only one, remember, there's only one Revelation. But in Revelation, uh, what goes into the lake of fire? Uh, verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death of the lake of fire. Um, and this is kind of, it's anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. <laughs> it's not a book, it's just me. So, Every name is in the book of life. Anyway, um, but what does go into the lake of fire? Death. Hades. Like the inevitability, the, the, the outcome, the end, right? Eschatology, words about the end. The end of all things, according to the revelation. Is and it's not just according to the revelation, it's actually bedrock Christian teaching. The end of all things is the destruction of death's power. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Right? Um, <clears throat> So that's hell. Um, by contrast, the Bible speaks far more frequently, far more frequently, like magnitudes more frequently about him. Right, so what is that? Um, in, in the Hebrew Bible, it gets a little confusing because God is the maker of heaven and earth, right? And oftentimes, heaven or the heavens is simply up. Um, it's the sky, it's space, it's heaven, <laughs> right? Um, but it's also named as the place where God resides. But what you then begin to if you pay attention, see is that God doesn't reside in the sky. Oftentimes, God is found on earth. Specifically, God is named as present in the tabernacle with the Hebrews as they journey through the wilderness, and then ultimately in the temple. The temple is where God resides. So there is this sense in which heaven at least as the dwelling place of God, is not up. It's in all kinds of places, right? And here's where we got into trouble. Not, not trouble so much. Here is where being a 21st century Christian is difficult when reading a, a text that originates somewhere in the 6th or 7th centuries B.C., right? And it's what we call, how many of you are familiar with the term three-tiered universe? I love teaching kids about this, right? Think about what it was like to live on this earth two, three thousand years. This is it. Now, that happens. Okay. Now, why would you think that God resides in the heavens? Well, first of all, the heavens are huge, right? Very expansive. But what do you need 
Besides air, what do you need to live? You need water. Where does water come from? Yes. And it waters the earth, and the earth grows food, and that's how we live. And so good things come from the sky, and that's where God resides. And what do we do if, if we're not, uh, there are other places they don't do this, but where do, uh, what's one of the things that particularly Hebrew culture does with people who die? We put them in the ground, right? I have to qualify that because in Indian culture, you put them on a pyre and you burn them up, right? But in Hebrew culture, you put them in the ground. So, of course, that's where Sheol is. Sheol's under the, under the earth, right? This is the three-tiered universe. But we live in the 21st century. So do we know that beyond this are galaxies upon galaxies and black holes and infinite space as far as we can see? And it's only as far as we can see. We don't even know what lies beyond what we can see, right? And we also happen to know with some certainty that under the earth is the mantle and under the mantle is the core and under the core is the inner core, um, liquid uh, metal center of our planet. We have some idea of how our planet is composed. Um, interesting though, that we do put like the fires of hell under the earth where it's like, well, yeah, it does get pretty hot down there. Burn up down and burn you up. Um, but so, <laughs> One of the problems that we have is that we have centuries of imaginative um, work built on this. And it doesn't hold up for the 21st century. We have to start thinking about it differently. And my, this is my color commentary. Make sure I own this. I think this is lazy. Right? I mean, it makes sense if you're a first century human being living on planet Earth because you don't have access to that information. But you have access to the information. So to simply ignore it and to continue to insist on this model is willfully stupid. Okay, sorry. Um, it bothers me because what I'm about to tell you, which is this. <clears throat> For Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, if you listen to the Beatitudes, who does it belong to? Oh. Specifically, and ah, the meek. Let's see, let's see all the, the blessings. Yeah, so the very first one, the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are poor in spirit. And then you can go down the list. The, 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 those who mourn will be comforted, the meek will inherit the earth, um, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. If you keep going down, um, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Suddenly, the kingdom of heaven is not about where you go, where you die. It is something that you receive and you receive in the poverty of your spirit. That's very different than something you earn. Right? I don't see a whole lot of people aspiring to be poor in spirit. But if you're, they're honest, I am poor in spirit. If I, if I thought I could do it myself, I'd be in a lot of trouble. But the only way I can stand up here or there or anywhere else and do any of this work is to know that I am the recipient of something that is not mine. Right? Left to my own devices, I'm very responsible. As is evidenced when I drive. <laughs> but it's so it's an inheritance that's both now, it's an inheritance. Love that word. And what can I just ask? I know that it's probably not wise because it's, it seems like it's uncertain, but 
if you know you're going to inherit something, you act different, don't you? You make different decisions. Because you know what, what's, what's been promised to you. And you act according to that promise. Now, that's dangerous when it comes to humans because humans are not God, but God can be trusted. There's an inheritance that is both now and later. Um, so let's get into just really unpack where we are then as Reformed Christians. <laughs> because you do get the Middle Age art that talks about eternal damnation and heaven with angels and cherubs and the reward of the righteous. And, and some of that language is, is echoed by the Westminster Catechism. So I want to make sure we own that. Um, but there's also in the same catechism a caveat in its description of the Lord's Prayer that heaven is God's will on earth and our participation in it. That's what we're taught to pray for, right? I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our prayer is to participate in the presence of God in this world on earth. That's where heaven is. Okay. By the way, and I don't think I got into this, but it's my favorite thing to tell people. Um, this is also kind of important. So who goes to hell? Not me. <laughs> you know the answer to this. You say it every time we baptize them. Who goes to hell? Jesus goes to heaven. And John Calvin, actually, no, excuse me, Heidelberg, the Heidelberg Catechism, another one of our confessions, talking about the sentence that Christ, this is quote from the Catechism, Christ my Lord has redeemed me from hellish anxieties. Right? Jesus goes to hell so I don't have to. Or, goes to hell so that I know that I'm not alone in whatever hell I am going through. Jesus is there with me. In fact, that's kind of the whole thing. And he redeems me from those hells that I find myself in. So to the person who is trying to get clean, or to the person who is trying to leave an abusive situation, or to the person who is fleeing a war-torn land, or fleeing cartels in the South, Jesus is the one who journeys with me. That's the promise of, of where God is in him, right? There is no place that I can go that you are not. Okay. So, now we get to the What John Calvin says in his instance, is that what it boils down to is this. And this kind of goes along with Jesus, right? Hell is being cut off. Specifically, cut off from communion with God. Right? Hell is when we find our, it, it is is the product of our sin. Because what does our sin do? Our sin separates us, cuts us off from communion with God. And people, absolutely. Yeah, hand in hand. The reason why it's love God, love neighbors is because you can't have one without the other. Right? And vice versa. So Calvin was less interested in afterlife destination and more interested in the spiritual reality that we're talking about. Um, but here's the other thing. Going back to Jesus. Jesus doesn't stay in heaven. Right? He ascended into heaven. Now, I am going to teach you in one minute the doctrine of election, which is not about predestination. But, if God chose to take on human flesh in Jesus Christ. And that human flesh conquers death, um, goes to hell, 
ascends into heaven. Whatever is assumed is redeemed. This is the Gregory of uh, Nazianzus, the church father. Um, because we are chosen, because humanity has been chosen by God in Christ, he has elected to take on human flesh. And that flesh has ultimately ascended into heaven. We are taken up with him. Right? Human flesh is ascendant in Christ. This is what Paul talks about, right? That I'm raised with Christ. Um, that's election. Chosen. It's not predestination. It's chosen. Now, double predestination is not my jam, so I'm not going to keep going. I'm not going to keep um, Here's what I want to leave you with, though. Um, <laughs> It is about this. It is about our relationship to God, and specifically our relationship to God through Christ. It's not something we do. It's something that is done for us in Christ. Um, our redemption, our salvation, um, the hell that we are saved from is the hell of alienation that we create through our own sin. Jesus conquers both sin and death. And we are caught up with him in that. So um, heaven isn't just your destiny. It is your reality. It is what you are called to, call, where you are called to be, what you are called to enter into. Jesus often talks about entering into the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about an afterlife destination. He's talking about entering into the will of God, present and powerful in the world. That is what it means to pray, your will be done on earth as it is. Enter into what God is up to. He's happy. To be a part of it. And Jesus saves us from the hells of our own provision, of our own sin. Thank you. Uh, thanks be to God. Better solution than ours. <laughs> Absolutely. And quite honestly, uh, and again, my color commentary, far more interesting. I know it makes for really good art and cartoons, right? But in terms of human thriving, yeah, I'll take that. I mean, our, our only other way of doing it is judgment and shame. Right. That doesn't seem to work. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really down on shame. Yeah, no, I don't think that's, I don't think that's what Jesus is. It's interesting too because if you if you read the gospels, there are a lot of people who are still trafficking in shame, and Jesus finds all kinds of ways to circumvent. Yeah, yeah, he's pretty awesome, that Jesus. I like him a lot. <laughs> all right, go in peace. Uh, if you haven't been to worship, Essie has a great sermon for you. Um, welcome to the first Sunday in Advent, in keeping with our uh, theme of Christian hope. Hope that in this season of Advent, you relinquish what you think you deserve in order to receive what's coming to you. <laughs>